OK? Uh, I think you are all uh, now charged up for the last session on the actual engineering, OK? So hopefully the lunch and the coffee will help now to concentrate better in this last session. And I'll expect some more questions from you. OK. Uh, Based on what we have covered till now, two independent things, right? One was the sustainability, which many of you are conversant with, and uh, why there is a need to do things differently. And independently, we looked at what are called advanced frugal innovations. Okay? My first question is, do you think that what we are going through currently, there's a reason why I took you through that climate change so elaborately. You think we have to do things differently? Or we can just continue with the way we are doing, you know, things that we do now. You know, like make our designs very conservative, pad them with a lot of material. Meaning, do you think that we need to design and engineer our products differently? Because I believe that the whole thing started climate change a lot due to technology, industrial revolution and all of that, right? But it is only technology which will help us solve it. A good way to tackle sustainability is to just let technology go away and just maybe live like a hermit or like a sage, you know, and kind of live with the nature. But that's not possible. Once you have tasted technology, I think you want to kind of uh, experience more of it. So I believe that technology is the answer to also kind of mitigate the problems of climate change and help us live with it. That's, that's one thing that I wanted to uh, bring out for presenting that. How did you find uh, uh, slides on advanced frugal innovations? We went in a series of products, right? Right from the simple to some very exotic ones. Do you see any potential in that? Right? To me, what caught my attention was the low cost, lesser resources, low cost, and also good functionality. It's like three things which are you know very... Uh, uh, you never get... Maybe, you know, you at the most manage to get one of them, but getting all three together in one product. If you can design it in such a way that you get all of these in one product, that might be something really very good. Okay? Lesser resources, which is good from a sustainability perspective. Lower cost, more people can afford it. And uh, good functionality. Quality is good. So this will raise the living standards. Right? So that's the beauty of why we should look into advanced frugal products and what we, what we are calling frugal engineering. Okay? Engineering for developing frugality from scratch. Okay? How do you go about developing frugality uh, from scratch in a product? What are the ways to do it according to you? If I tell you there is design engineering, okay, let me write it down. What would be important okay, from an engineer's, or let's not even think about engineers for now. The way people attack this problem in the frugal community is if you want to get a frugal product, right, they concentrate on the cost. Get it to low cost. A low cost will in turn give you like simple design, all of that, okay? But now, to do this, you have things like engineering, okay? And then there is uh, sales, there is finance, Okay, all of the others, right? There is a lot of uh, management stuff that is involved here. What, what may I ask you is important in these to affect frugality or to make frugality possible? What would be a good way to do it? Effective way to do it? Please feel free to kind of, you know, voice your opinion, no problem. What would be important? Like the engineering of it? or maybe the sales or the financial matters associated with this product. Please know that each one of these can lower the cost, right? And one of the major goals of a frugal product is to lower the cost. Yeah, please. So what is the calculation that you talk about? Is it with respect to uh, which one would it be out of these? Calculation with respect to what? With sales? With 
sell at the end. So which one would you use? So to sell at that price, right, you have to use, say, one of these or together, I don't know. You have engineering, you have sales, you have uh, finance, right? Meaning engineering, I can engineer something which is not a normal product, but I can play with the sales team to lower the price, to make it low price. So you'll call it it's a frugal product, right? So I'm saying, is, is, is that a good way of doing it? So what would, you, uh, what would be your opinion as engineers? Based on what we have talked today, the climate change problem and advanced frugal innovations, we have seen the potential of advanced frugal products in consuming lesser resources, giving good functionality at a low cost. Agreed? And uh, we have climate change a problem going on in the background. Although it is creating a lot of issues, okay, it is also creating a lot of opportunities okay, to make new products. Okay, so there is a lot of business waiting here, in, also in this kind of a scenario. And I, I believe that advanced frugal products can make a big dent here. But how do you make them, right? Or how do you make the concept of an advanced frugal product possible? Do I make it possible through finance and sales or some of these other activities? Or I make it possible through engineering? Or I use a combination of all? Is my question clear? I can engineer a product for frugality, right? I can engineer something for frugality, low cost and all that. Or I can make a normal product which is not frugal, but I use some sales tricks to lower the cost. Again, a defining feature of being frugal, low cost. And finance, I can do something else or any of the other things, you know, supply chain and all that. Yeah? Agreed. Yes. The whole, you know, all these things play a part, but please remember that as engineers, you can build a product from scratch which is frugal, which is more important. It is important to get frugality from a product and later from sales and finance. If I'm getting it from sales and finance, my product is something normal and it has wasted a lot of energy. And probably from a life cycle assessment point of view, it is a net energy emitter, not saver. Okay? It has consumed a lot of resources. It has consumed all kinds of resources. It is really very expensive to make. But I'm using some sales gimmick to kind of lower the cost and make it frugal, which is not good. So it is engineering that is the first step that has to be you know, accounted for. You engineer a frugal product from scratch and then use sales and other things to use cost further. So that's the you know, uh, viewpoint that we will take in this class. We are engineers and we want to design and fabricate an advanced frugal product from scratch. By doing this, the advantage is I'll be using lesser resources, okay, and uh, lower cost, lesser emissions, and I'll also be aiming for good functionality by doing all of this. So that is the basis for this topic on uh, frugal engineering. Okay, so first of all, I, the, the designs that we have been doing till now, right, what we are doing as part of traditional engineering is conservative in nature, meaning you use more material than what is required. So because of more materials, there are more greenhouse gas emissions. Typically, there are always exceptions to this, but typically you'll agree with me that more the materials, more the attendant greenhouse gas emissions. Higher cost because more materials and excess material resources, okay? So it should be excess material resources used in a conservative design, higher cost, and more GHG emissions. And based on what we have seen, and with climate change and other crises going on in the background, there is a big opportunity to frugalize engineering and frugalize products. So frugal engineering deals with a streamlined product consuming minimal material resources, robust functionality, and low cost, okay? So please remember that your product has to consume minimal resources in its making, okay? It has to be low in cost and it has to give very good functionality. In a way, all these things are also, they affect each other. So by being low cost, typically, you might not have room to use more materials. But by using lesser materials, I can also lower the cost, okay? Although this is very simple to look at, once you look at, for a given product, you look at a whole family of materials and everything possible, 
a lot of research has to be done to get the right combination to get what you want. Okay? Get these three features. Uh, product consuming minimal material resources, robust functionality, and low cost. Okay? Uh, so the pillars of frugal engineering, right? like any product development, is frugal design and frugal materials. You are manufacturing and then quality control. This is typical of any engineering, right? Uh, uh, engineering of a product, or what we call product development. You start with a concept and then uh, prototyping, manufacturing, uh, all of that, right? And uh, uh, the operation or the running, maintenance, end of life, all of that. So I'm saying that every one of those pillars has to be frugalized to make frugal engineering because if you want to realize the goal of low cost, good quality, and lower resources, you have to frugalize every activity of engineering. Only then can you make this goal possible because we want one you know, discipline which is applicable to any product in any sector. So this has to be the general rule. And so by these three pillars that you see here will actually consider most of the stages in product development. And if there are some that I've omitted, you can add them here, but you have to figure out a way to frugalize them. Okay, so let's see how we frugalize each in turn. Anytime there is, you know, a, a doubt or you want to agree or disagree, please let me know. I would also like to hear from your side what you think. So please feel free to intervene and ask a question. Right? So, uh, manufacturing, right? When you look at manufacturing, there are different ways of doing it. I can do either casting, I can do cutting, or I can do extrusion, right? There are different ways of uh, uh, realizing a design. Once you have a design, how do you realize it through manufacturing? But even within manufacturing, I'm saying there are so many different processes available. Even within process, there are so many variations possible. Okay? You have casting, okay, which is casting and extrusion. They go with uh, uh, a certain volume of material which are given a definite shape. So there is not much wastage in material. Okay? Do you see what I'm saying? Unlike in cutting, I deliberately remove material to give the shape. So typically in metal cutting, we waste a lot of material. Okay? Or do I go for non-traditional? Do you know what is non-traditional? Non-traditional cutting, have you heard about it in manufacturing? Anybody? Non-traditional cutting? This is cutting in the non-traditional way, machining. So if I tell you that I can use water to cut a block of granite, water, okay? You might not believe me, but that's what we do in non-traditional cutting. We take water and uh, pump it to very high pressures and at supersonic speeds, we kind of cut blocks of granite. So for some applications, you can't use a metal tool or a ceramic tool. You have to use non-traditional media, but they consume a lot of energy. Okay, that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. So these process details are very important in frugal engineering. Or I can use powder metallurgy. I take powder and you know mold them into the desired shape. Or additive manufacturing, like what we are seeing in the last couple of decades, Additive manufacturing has become very popular. Uh, regarding additive manufacturing, what is uh, your opinion? Is it a good technology for any material? Any material. I'm not saying metallic or non-metallic, anything. You think it's a good thing to have? It can, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, is it good for any material? Or do you think it is good only for certain classes of materials, like such as? Plastics, okay. Uh, what about metals? Right. Right. Any alloy, right, agreed. So, he has raised a very good point. Yes, plastics. Printing is a very mature technology, 3D printing, additive manufacturing. But metals, there is a problem. Is anybody aware of it? Why metals? We can 3D print a metal, don't get me wrong, okay? But today if you tell me that this entire aircraft is 3D printed out of metal, I will not fly in that, okay? So knowing how this thing is, how 3D printing works, uh, I, I, I will have reservations. But why am I saying so? What can be a problem with 3D printing of metals? Is anyone aware of it? Of metals, not plastics. 
he's right in saying that metals you know how do we we, we can 3d print metals by the way most of the high melting point uh, metals can be 3d printed because we have high power lasers which can do the job that's not a problem but in 3d printing do you agree with me that your the microstructure of a metal plays a big role right and have you heard about something called isotropy and anisotropy isotropy in properties right you need to have the same property at every point and same in any direction if your property is very with direction we get anisotropic materials meaning your material is weak in one direction and strong in another direction so if you make a product out of such a material it will fail in the weaker direction so 3d printing has that problem now of metals if you 3d print a metallic part it will give a columnar structure not equiaxed you need a equiaxed for isotropic material so 3d printed metals have severe anisotropy even now okay so they are trying to work around it and i'm sure they'll solve the problem soon so 3d printing lately has turned out to be very good for plastics and metals it is improving so my point is you have all these processes available to you right so many processes manufacturing so my goal here is to make a frugal product from scratch an advanced frugal product so which one do i pick again same problem right how do i go about uh, uh, in i mean manufacturing is a very big decision in engineering you you make your design but how do you cut it and if i want to make this as an advanced frugal product then i have to keep the cost low at all stages and keep my resources low at all stages but always aim for good functionality okay those three principles are common to all so i have to be very careful you know which manufacturing operation i pick based on that based on the tenets of frugal engineering after manufacturing you know the same thing with materials which material do i use there are so many right you have uh, plastics you have ceramics a uh, polymer ceramics composites metals and they span over such a big range of mechanical properties right this is yield strength and if you look at it like ceramics have very high strength but they have uh, bad ductility they are quite brittle metals have a good combination you know of strength and ductility you can shape them and you can get them in the shape that you want uh then you have polymers plastic like materials elastomers rubbers and then of course composites so for a given product again same problem you know low cost good functionality and you know you have to keep your resources low so which one do i pick so the principles of frugal engineering apply at every level okay only by applying it to every level you end up getting a good you know advanced frugal product so materials more than choosing the materials right after choosing once i choose a certain material am i done with it for example if i go with a certain steel here with a certain strength am i done with my selection process or do i need to is there something else after that i'm not talking about manufacturing i'm just saying selecting a material right say i want to use steel and i look at this book by ashby right and it says it has a good yield strength good mechanical properties and i pick that material so can i go ahead and use it just as a manufacturer give me this steel and i'm done with it you understanding my thing right my question i i'm 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 say i'm deciding on using a stainless steel alloy some stainless steel and i look at a manufacturer and i get the same number and he sends me the material can i use it directly what do you do with it as an engineer any would you blindly follow that or would you do something else to confirm your right you should as as engineers i'm always telling you you know it's a it's always good to take a piece of this and test for what it is because there is a lot of uncertainty and variability in everything you buy from batch to batch okay you need to know the grain structure you need to know the hardness the strength you know convince yourself yes it follows very much close to what they have mentioned you need these real good properties otherwise you know your design will suffer you will have uncertainties coming in your design and when you have uncertainties coming in your design you raise the factor of safety that's a problem that's a problem okay so typically when you select a material it doesn't end there right you uh, also need to know the crystal structure 
okay? Different crystal structures, if it is a face-centered cubic, it is easier to deform plastically, easier to shape. It works well in manufacturing. But if I take hexagonal close packed, like what is shown here, typical of titanium and other alloys, right? They have better strength, but they are bad to manufacture. You have to consider these things in detail before, you know, for any frugal application. And once you select the material, you know, what are the mechanical properties, like I just told you? Is it really close to what the manufacturer is talking about? You know, what are the different strengths, the ductility involved? And then the phase diagram, okay? You also, why would you need a phase diagram? Anybody? You know what's a phase diagram, right? A phase diagram for a given alloy, it gives a relationship between the composition, the temperature, right? And the phases present. So one look at the diagram, and I know the composition and the temperature, I can tell you what phases are involved and what will be the properties. That's the beauty of it. Why would I need a phase diagram? I've selected my material. I know the crystal structure selected my material. Would you need a heat treatment for your metal? Right? Here we are going with metals. I'm assuming that we'll use a metal for a product. But the same reasoning holds for other materials too. You have to do your due diligence. Right? You have to look into the details. A phase diagram is very helpful for heat treatments and other, you know, post treatments that you give to metals. Right? See, many metals have a certain strength at a certain composition and temperature range. But I can just improve the strength by giving it a heat treatment and quenching it. So these phase diagrams are very useful in doing that. So it's not just, you know, once you select a material, you have to know the whole set of working conditions for that material, compositions, everything there is to know about it, and get those set of parameters uh, which will make the material the best possible, the strongest possible metal to use in the least amount that you want, okay, to qualify for a frugal product. And green structure, very important, okay? So, in this diagram that I've shown here, right, uh, which do you think is a good green structure to have? You see columnar green structures here, you see equiaxed, and I see equiax greens here, okay? So, the mechanical engineers can tell me this. I'm not, uh, I know some of you are in the biomedical. I'm so sorry that I'm asking some of the mechanical questions, so don't feel bad about it, okay? That's, these questions are just to kind of get you thinking, okay? So, it's okay. So typically in engineering, you know, uh, we need, we want to have these equiax greens. So when you have an equiax green, typically in any direction, you have the same property value. It doesn't vary, isotropic. So you, we always aim for this. So my point is, even selecting a material is so complicated. You have to look at the crystal structure, you have to look at the strength involved, the heat treatment is necessary, the phase diagram, the, the microstructure involved. You have to get all these things right, okay? for the application that you are targeting. But I'm saying with the principles of frugal engineering will help you, will guide you through this to select the right material combination to do what it takes, okay? We'll soon see how we do that. Uh, materials, can anybody guess what is this? What kind of a material are we looking at? Anybody? Huh? This is very interesting, okay? This research was done at Purdue University. I, by the way, I did my PhD at Purdue uh, in manufacturing, Department of Mechanical Engineering, in high-speed manufacturing. And then I did my postdoc also at Purdue in industrial engineering, but in a different group on manufacturing using uh, on nanocrystalline materials. So this is work from that group later. It's a very interesting application. What is the material that you see here? Pardon me? Areca palm, yes. You know what she's talking about? The areca palm, PA. Uh, let me write it for you. So, what is this? What kind of a material is that? Is it a metal? It's a wood. It's a wood. And in India, we are now using this, uh, the leaf or the sheath of the areca to make all kinds of uh, food products, you know, in which you can use like a plate, a spoon, they're all made of this areca. 
Okay, they are all made of areca. The one good thing about this, if you look at the embodied energy, you typically use plastics many times. The embodied energy of plastics is very high, but for the palm, areca is very low, and paper is in between. And the beauty of this material is it is recyclable. You know, once you uh, you collect it, you clean it, you can form it, disposal, earth, and the cycle just continues. Okay, but why am I showing this for a frugal material? Right, from frugal application. What can be the advantage? One thing, it's sustainable. I can keep using again and again. It is widely available. Cost is low. Quality can be good. What does this tell you? What does this tell you? The plates that you show shown here. Uh, how how does it uh, relate from the metal point of view? If I talk about metals, I would like to shape metals, right? And I talked about all the manufacturing processes for metals. I showed you cutting. I showed you casting. I also showed you something called forming. Extrusion is called a forming operation. Okay. This, if you look here, it is actually formed from wood. It's a forming operation. Okay. Forming is typically used for metals, but now they are using it to make products out of wood. And uh, you have heard about a quantity called strain, stress and strain, right? So the strain involved here, the strain, how much do you think is the strain involved here in making this? Anybody? A guess? What would be the strain? If you are aware of it, okay? I mean, if you know the term strain, it's okay. Strain is a measure of deformation. So, right, if I take a specimen and pull it, in the simplest case, the elongation upon the original length is a ratio that gives me the strain. Right? So if I elongate by 50%, then 0.5 is my strain. Agreed? So with that in mind, how much do you think is the strain that has been put into the process to make this? Any guesses? How much? Two? Two? Okay. Uh, anybody? No? It's, it's about close to 200%. Okay, 200% strain. And if you wet it, if you dip it in water, you can go to higher strains, meaning you get more ductility out of it. So wood is now turning out to be a very appealing material. We saw it in the bamboo bike. We are seeing it here again. And this, I, hope, I don't know if I have it here or maybe I'll show it to you later. Uh, uh, these are the, some of the uh, uniaxial stress strain diagrams. Okay, we do tension testing. This was actually put for a tension test. And you can see that the ductility is reduced. It, it improves with hydration, but where the strength is high, the ductility is low, just behaving like metals. And you can actually form wood, okay? You can process it like metals to make all these useful structures, okay? So when you select a material for a frugal product, there is a big, I'm saying, you know, a choice for you. Metals, polymers, plastics, wood. There is no limit to it. And there are many ways of doing it also. You can use origami, uh, you know, oxytic structures, okay? Have you heard about this structure called oxytic? Oxytic structure. Are you aware of Poisson's ratio, Poisson's effect? So when you pull something, it reduces in cross-section, am I right? That's called a Poisson effect. Whereas in this case, when you pull something, it expands. Okay, you can actually structure the material in such a way that it does this. It's very interesting. And it has got a lot of applications for load bearing. So one has to think about all this to, for a frugal application. Lower materials, lesser cost, good functionality. Okay, sky is the limit. Okay, there are so many ways to look at it. Uh, do you, do, can you tell me what material this building is made from? Reflective glasses and steel structures. Okay, thank you, Shilfa. Yeah, anybody? What material will this be made of the building? Come on, engineers, take a go. This is, you know, you can, nice buildings in Germany. You'll definitely take a pick. 
Tell me what it's. He says it is stainless steel and uh, glass, right? So from, from architecture, right, Shilfa? Architecture, okay, thanks. Again, I can see the answer has that wisdom, yeah, so. Anybody? Concrete, okay, not bad. That's it, right? Anybody, any, uh, any other takers? No, okay. What if I tell you the whole thing is made of wood? It's made of wood. I think you knew it? Okay, it's made of wood. This was made, it's made in Canada. And this has become very popular now. Uh, I think just last week I read news in MIT's tech download probably. I think they've created like a 30 story wooden uh, building. Okay, and this is fireproof and all that. Of course, you, the wood is taken and processed. Okay, to make it possible to, uh, so that it has the right load bearing abilities for a building. Okay, and it's made of wood. So a lot of nice things happening now. We are talking about climate change and all that, but this is also the era when a lot of nice things are happening around you. Big data, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, new materials. There are so many things happening around us. Okay, this should be used to advantage. Okay, now we are coming to the gist of frugal engineering. Uh, so, in frugal engineering, we design a new factor called the factor of frugality. This is very similar to your factor of safety. In fact, it includes a factor of safety. So I would say, in frugal engineering, if you want to use lower materials at lower cost, what would you do? In traditional design, what would you do? If you want to use lesser materials, what do you do? You use a lower safety factor for design, right? Higher safety factor typically consumes more material, okay? So different industries, different sectors have different safety factors. Like nuclear industry uses a safety factor of five. They use more materials because for safety, okay, you need to do that. Uh, but there, if you take the aviation industry, the safety factor is like 1.5 to 1.3 to 1.5. They do that because they want to, you know, save on the weight. Because saving on the weight, you can be more fuel efficient, which is very important for a plane, for an aircraft. Okay, so the goal here is to, in frugal engineering, we go for a very low safety factor to start with. 1.5, 1.3 to 1.5. If I go with a safety factor of one, I'm operating at a failure load. You can read it later in a mechanical design textbook. It is very straightforward, okay? Very easy to understand. So you start at a low safety factor, so you consume lesser materials to begin with. That's the first thing of, one of the things in frugal engineering, right? You have to lesser resources, so I go with a low safety factor. Low safety factor, why do I need rigorous design? Uh, what do I mean by rigorous design? with a low safety factor. Anybody? When you have a lower safety factor, right, uh, you're operating closer to the failure load, okay? So now, if I have a safety factor which is low to begin with, I have to make sure my design is very good. I'm using proper materials, the best data for that material, the most accurate mathematical models, the most accurate data for my materials, everything has to be low in uncertainty, right? And why do we go with a higher safety factor? To avoid uncertainties in design, right? Because there are uncertainties in manufacturing, there are uncertainties in materials, there are uncertainties in assembly, blah, blah, right? The easiest way to do that, the lazy way to do that is to jack up or make your factor of safety high, right? It accounts for all those safety factors by putting more material into the product, that's it. That's the basis to it. So I'm saying we reduce that number, factor of safety, because now the way we have progressed, we have models which are very accurate, we have data which are also very good, and it is possible to rigorously design with very accurate models, with very accurate data, to reach a safety factor of 1.5 or 1.3, low safety factor. So by using a low safety factor, I'm going for lesser materials, but I'm using rigorous design because my safety factor is low, so I'm also getting good quality because my design is good. You follow me, right? So by choosing a low safety factor, I'm going for lesser materials and also good quality in the product because my design is rigorous. I don't stop there, okay? I don't stop there. So I take a low safety factor and fix it at that value. And after that, for every next step in product development, 
say, manufacturing, all the others, I keep on saving more and more material. And the savings I get there, I keep adding it to my safety factor to get what is called the factor of frugality. I'm sorry. Okay, that's a new safety factor. I will show you how this thing works. Okay, so don't get confused. It has got two parts to it, a safety factor, okay, which we use in traditional design, and there is something called MS, material saved. Material saved in addition to a low safety factor. I'll show you soon how this works. But the takeaway here is you need a low safety factor to begin with because that saves material for you and saves costs. But your design has to be very rigorous because your safety factor is quite low. But by following a rigorous design, I get good quality of my product. Okay, so that's how this thing works. Okay, that's a symbolic representation, F raised to S, where F is my factor of frugality and S is the safety factor. Okay, we'll see in a minute how this works. Now, the example I'm going to use to tell the concepts of the factor of frugality will be a circular shaft. A shaft is a very standard, you know, mechanical engineering element. You will find it in any textbook on design. It's very easy to follow, okay? And we are following a very simple example of transmitting power in a, under torsional loading in a rotating shaft. Okay, I'm keeping it very simple. Circular shaft, rotating and transmitting power. That's it. We'll see how to design this in a frugal manner. Okay, so that's my shaft and it is torsional loading. So it is loaded under pure shear. Pure shear meaning there are only shearing stresses. I don't have any normal stresses here, tensile or compressor, only shearing stresses, okay? And uh, what do we use? Any idea what this equation is called? Anybody? Mechanical engineers? Very, very popular equation for designing a shaft. Don't worry if you don't know the answer, okay? It also happens to us, okay? We are not know-it-alls, but if you have any hint. It's called the torsion equation. Okay, torsion equation, which is used to design a shaft. So that is what is called the polar moment of inertia, which shows how your mass is distributed about a rotational axis. It's the equivalent of mass for rotary motion, right? And uh, this is the radius from the shaft. So C will be equal to R for maximum length, okay? T allowable is the allowable working stress, okay? So this is related to my factor of safety. So your factor of safety, Right, S is given by the maximum tau upon tau allowable, okay? So I get the tau allowable by dividing tau max by S. Am I making sense? Right? So when this is equal to one, allowable is equal to maximum failure load. That's what I was telling you. You have to be careful when your safety factor is low. So. This is my allowable working stress, which is obtained from the factor of safety, okay? And then T is a torque that is acting on the shaft. So using this, I can actually design the shaft. For a given length, I can figure out what the diameters are, okay? So I'm going to pick this example to talk to you about the concepts of frugal uh, engineering, especially if, uh, the factor of frugality-based design. Any questions based on this till now? Or you can even ask me after this session. Okay, any doubts? It's very straightforward, please don't get confused. And I'm using a power of 500 kilowatts and 1200 RPM, standard problem. You'll find this in Ugural 2015, very standard text, it's available online. You can take a look and maybe work it out to just convince yourself. So here is a solid shaft. You know, based on the conditions I showed you in the previous slide, for 500 kilowatts and 1200 RPM, I'm assuming a certain steel with a certain strength characteristics. I get this diameter for my shaft, solid shaft, okay? This is what I need to transmit that power at that RPM, a solid shaft. But if I make it hollow, right, these are the dimensions I get. What is the advantage of using a hollow shaft? Anybody? The advantage of using a hollow shaft. You're using less volume of material. Thank you. Yes, lesser material for a hollow shaft. And you'll be surprised to know a hollow shaft has better structural integrity 
than a solid shaft. Okay, the moment of finish here plays uh, to the benefit of a hollow shaft. We know this from strength of materials. Now, this is what frugal design does. So, the first thing I do, I start with a very low safety factor of 1.5. Okay, for my factor of frugality F. F is equal to S. Okay, F factor of frugality is equal to S. That's the first step. Okay, I go with a you know, very low safety factor, say 1.5. Now, I keep my safety factor fixed. I will not change it throughout the process. Okay, now within this 1.5, safety factor domain, I look at all possible designs compared to a solid shaft which will save yet more material. Okay? You see, if I take a 1.5 safety factor, I'm saving material compared to a safety factor of 3 or 4 or 5 or 2 or whatever. But I'm saying once I fix my safety factor at 1.5, I will have a range of designs within that 1.5 uh, safety factor group wherein I can save yet more material. So, if I, if I de design a solid shaft at 1.5 safety factor, I can actually design a hollow shaft with the same safety factor of 1.5 and save more material. Okay? So that's the first step. I start with 1.5 and then add to it the savings in weight coming from a hollow shaft when compared to a solid shaft at a factor of safety of 1.5. Am I clear? So, 1.5 plus savings in the weight of the material from a hollow shaft, okay? So, I fix my design at a hollow shaft, okay? It is saving materials from a low safety factor and also by being hollow. Next stage is manufacturing, right? I need to make a hollow shaft of those dimensions. Uh, what manufacturing process do I use? Remember, frugal engineering wants us to use low cost uh, and then lesser amount of materials. So, I have to look for a manufacturing process which is low cost and it does not waste a lot of material. So in this case, I'm going for <clears throat> what is called extrusion. So I take a certain volume of material and I can just extrude it to the shaft I want. I'm not wasting any material. And it gives me the right finish and all that. So hypothetically, if I had to machine this shaft, machine a hollow shaft from a solid one, I'd be wasting so much of material in it. So I compare that with extrusion and figure out what are the savings in the weight of material reduced with a hollow, you know, with an extruded hollow shaft. That saves more material. Okay? So how I, so what are my savings till now? Low safety factor, and then going for a hollow shaft with that safety factor, and now extruding that hollow shaft. Okay? So there are three, you know, different ways by which I have saved material independently of each other. I'm adding all of that together. Finally, I'm saying, can I find something like this in the junkyard? Okay, if I have to salvage, I go somewhere and I find in a junkyard there are all these car parts and I find this hollow shaft, extruded hollow shaft, somebody has just junked it there, right? I pick it up. It has the same specs that I want. I don't even have to fabricate it, it's already done. So I'm saving yet more material now. Okay, I also add that to this total and I get my final factor of frugality. So I start with a factor of frugality at 1.5, safety factor, and then it becomes two because I'm saving 50% of weight in going for a hollow shaft in addition to 1.5. So 1.5 plus 0.5, and then when I come to extrusion, I'm saving like a lot of material compared to metal cutting. So I add one, the savings in the weight, to this, I get three, and finally I get four because I can replace the whole thing from a junkyard. Okay? So this, in a nutshell, is how this thing works. There are a couple of papers where I've described this in detail. You can just go through it. Okay? It's not difficult. It won't take time, I promise you. Okay? It's very straightforward. Uh, so I'm going from a factor of frugality of 1.5 to 4. That's a big increase. Okay? But you should, you should remember that a higher factor of frugality for a low safety factor is the best combination. Okay? That's what we are going with. And this principle guides you through the entire you know, product development route. The whole product development can be nicely gone through systematically with a factor of frugality approach. We talked about so many materials, manufacturing and all that, right? But if you follow the simple principle, it will help you to get the right combination that you want for your application. Okay, now here is again in a table format. 
So we start with a safety factor of 1.5, right? And uh, we start with 1.5 savings. The second step is 1.5 plus 0.5 coming from the hollow shaft, which is an alternative design. So 50% of weight is reduced in selecting a hollow shaft when compared to a solid shaft. In the third column, in addition to 1.5 and 0.5, I'm saving 100% in manufacturing by just extruding it and not machining it. Okay, 100% because there is zero wastage. So I'm actually 100% saving of material. So that boils down to one. So I add one there. And finally, I'm, re I'm, I'm getting this whole thing from an, uh, a, a junkyard or a salvage product. So again, I'm saving 100% in weight. I add another one. So finally, your bookkeeping tells you that the total value for F is four from 1.5 to begin with. And this can be applied to any product, okay? What if you have, a, a, for example, something like, uh, okay, sorry. And this, this chart tells you what are the maximum values your different factors can have. Your safety factor has to be from 1.3 to 1.5. And then for simple design, it is saying that a maximum savings can be obtained of 50%, okay, in a frugal design. But this depends on the application. This, you know, you have to frame these numbers yourself for your area. But here I'm saying that 50% is something realizable, you know, in uh, the current scenario. Manufacturing can save about 100%. Materials about 50%, biomimetics 50, and salvaging about 100% again. And all of these, one by one, get added to your safety factor to give you your factor of frugality F. So if you have a complicated product like this, any idea what is this? Right? Yeah, it's an IC engine of a car, right? So I think it's from a Ford F-150 pickup, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there are so many products here, right? How do you apply the factor of frugality here? I can take each product, design it by the factor of frugality, and then combine them together. But they might have different safety factors, right? In that case, you'll have to weigh them. The most important component gets a higher weighing. This is one way of doing it. And, but you be consistent in whatever you're following. And use that to kind of assemble the whole thing together. It would be good to have the same safety factor for all these components. So when you're assembling all these parts for a given product, it's good to stick with the same safety factor for all the parts of that product. So that assembly is easy. You can just add them together, add the F values. By the way, this is a first generation model, the first model, okay? I'm still working to correct it. So obviously there are versions will come out where, you know, we'll keep making this better and better. <clears throat> uh, this is something that uh, one of my students has designed. It is a, it's a rock crusher, a part for a rock crusher which was designed by the frugal design approach, by the factor of frugality approach, okay? He's also, I think, planning to commercialize this soon. But when you, when you have a frugal product, right, uh, do you agree with me that when you design something, uh, when you design any product, there are two kinds of loading that uh, a product is exposed to. There is something called design-based loading. You, you <coughs> design your product for a certain loading in mind. So for the shaft, we had like 500 kilowatts of power and 1200 RPM, okay? What if the power rating goes up, you know, momentarily? Maybe suddenly there's a spike in the loading, you know? Any component, maybe the load increases suddenly, you know, these things are dynamic in nature. How do you account for these? We call these as overloading, okay? You cannot think about them when you design a product, but this can happen during the service, during the life of a product. So the load will vary in a certain band and you have to keep that in mind. That's an uncertainty that we have to live with. So when you design a product with a factor of frugality approach, they are very well designed for the load that you are considering. But if there is a perturbation or if there is an overloading or a spike, that's a problem, okay? Uh, frugal products are not designed for that, but there is a way to get around that. So when you design any product, you know, by the traditional principles of design, like for example here, we have the same shaft, which is designed for a factor of safety of 1.5 and 3. All the other conditions are the same. And you can see that the higher safety factor has a higher overload bearing capacity, 200%. But my frugal shaft 
can still bear about 50% extra load, which is not bad. Okay? For a frugal shaft, with what I've designed, if it, if it can take 50% of load in addition to what it is designed for, which is not bad at all. Which is not bad at all. But what do we do if it goes beyond a 50% margin? Okay? There are different ways of tackling it. One thing that I have been looking into is uh, what we call complex systems. Have you heard about complex systems? Have you seen ants, little ants, going everywhere, right? Uh, if you have an ant, ant colony, they build up these huge ant hills. Have you seen those? Ever had a chance to see those? Okay. Nobody tells the ants that you have to make these. Okay. Nobody tells them that you have to make these ant hills. But it just happens. When there are so many of these simple agents talking to each other, you don't know what behavior will come out of it. What we call an emergent behavior. You cannot predict. And internet, internet is an example of a complex system. It's a huge network. So if you completely destroy one part of the internet, it is not going to be dead. It will work because other parts are active. Okay? This is what we call an emergent behavior. This is not designed. It is not engineered. It, it just happens. Okay? You can never engineer, you can never engineer a complex behavior. So what I am saying now is to have frugal products and make them into a complex network. That's the next stage, uh, next alternative. So, for this, we have to make a product adaptable. Okay? I'll tell you what I mean by being adaptable. So, here is another example of a shaft in a slightly more uh, uh, involved example. Okay? So, it is transmitting these loads to the gear here at E. Uh, and once you design this thing, right, and you figure out all the dimensions, you see that uh, you figure out the dimensions and all the loading, you, you notice that the C here is the weakest section. Okay? It's the weakest section. If you look at it, the bending moments are very high at C. Okay? And so, if you have to design it for bending, that thing is going to take a beating. So, what one needs to do is to take a section like C and give it a feature to adapt. Okay? If it knows a failure is coming, maybe it can morph. It can change its form. So it becomes stronger. Or maybe it can completely shut itself off. So it doesn't function anymore. But for this to happen, you have to put all these products in a network. Okay? This is what we call a network of frugal products. So you have to make your frugal products adaptive. Put sensors into them in the weakest locations. Make them adaptive so that when they know a failure is coming, they can either change their form or maybe shut themselves up completely. Okay? Whatever is correct. So in a network, the other frugal products will tell this particular product or any product that a failure is approaching and you should take a corrective action. So by having many of these frugal products in a network, we might get a complex behavior. Remember, you can never engineer a complex behavior. But I'm engineering my products such that okay, they might show complex behavior later. And what is this complex behavior? Well, they might adapt and you know, kind of morph into something to protect themselves or shut themselves completely. And in the process, the product doesn't fail by overloading. Okay? So you're enhancing the product, the life of the product, and it gives good functionality at a low cost. Okay? So this is one way of tackling it. And one interesting application of this is with the electric motor. Electric vehicle, I'm sorry, electric automotive vehicle. Electric, aut electric automotive, automotive vehicles are very simple in construction. If you compare them to an IC uh, engine vehicle, those are complicated systems. Okay? They are not complex, they are complicated. An Airbus aircraft is a complicated system. Okay? But I'm saying an electric vehicle is a simple system. You have a DC motor, a couple of some electronics, and a battery pack. That's it. Okay? And the beauty of an electric vehicle, you can also network it in a grid. Okay? It is very, uh, it, it, it lends itself to networking. So the deal here is to design every part of an electric vehicle frugally and to make them adaptive so that they can take corrective action, each product individually, when a failure is approaching. So you have this adaptive frugal product and put thousands or millions of these adaptive frugal products in a big network of grids and all that so that they can talk to each other. Okay, so that's it. this is what you see here. You have a frugal gridable electric vehicle 
and attach in a grid to the house, to the utility, and everything there, also talking to other vehicles. So the deal, the advantage of this is, you have all these vehicles that are connected to each other and to the grid. So if there is a failure coming, the electric vehicle can take a decision to save itself. Okay, shut itself or morph so that you can protect from the overloading. And in the case of electric vehicle, there are two advantages. You are, you, you are actually protecting a overloaded electric vehicle from failure, so improving its functionality. And number two, because it's in a grid, you can also manage the power very effectively. Okay, you can manage the power distribution by saving power, releasing it to the grid, and all of that. So this is one way of uh, improving the resilience of a, a frugal product, if I have to use that term, okay, from overloading. I tell you the papers to refer to where you can read all these concepts, okay, I'm just uh, going through these right now, so please, I see some blank faces, but don't worry about it. Simple concept, not very complicated. Finally, coming to frugal manufacturing, okay, how do we do this? Remember, again, the same, you have to always keep in mind the tenets of frugal engineering, and I told you in the shaft example that always we aim for a lesser material, lower cost, and good functionality. So accordingly, we took lower safety factor and rigorous design. So when I come to manufacturing, again, I have to keep my cost low, material wastage less, and again, I want good functionality from manufacturing itself. So I look for processes, manufacturing processes that are low cost, minimal number of low cost manufacturing processes to get the best quality product. Okay, so ideally, I want a single, low cost, single pass, one process, okay, giving me the functionality that I want with zero wastage. Okay, let me see if I can clear these concepts with some of these examples here. So this is called super plastic forming, okay, of an, some super alloy. So typically we have this uh, pressurized forming gas, which this whole plate is heated to a high temperature and then the forming gas, you know, when it uh, impinges or falls on the plate against the die here, the die takes a shape, it has, the sheet takes the shape of the die because it's in a very high heated state. Now, the deal with this is, after I'm done with this, I need an extra stage to heat treat to get the right microstructure. Okay, this is very normal in this kind of a business. But you can combine these two together, okay, so that I can do the forming and the heat treatment in one go. So now this is a single pass process with lesser resources and hopefully lesser cost, but giving the same or better quality. Giving the same or better quality. A still better example would be metal cutting, okay? Because this I think a lot of you can relate to. When you cut a metal, you typically have to do a rough cut, okay? Uh, two rough cuts maybe, and then you do a finishing cut. You do this so that you get the right surface finish. And then I told you about residual stresses, right? And now to get compressive residual stresses, you have to do something called short peening, which will give you the right compressive stress in the subsurface. So these are too many passes, too many processes. They all add to the cost and a lot of wastage. But I can do a single pass I can do a single pass cut with high speed machining, okay? One pass, that's it. One pass at a very high speed, it removes lesser material, but gives me the right finish and the right residual stresses. So again, according to frugal engineering, single pass, low cost, good quality surface, and nearly lesser wastage, okay? Nearly lesser wastage. Uh, here is, you know, the table that quantifies the savings in material. So by going for the frugal high-speed machining, I'm saving about uh, close to 90% of material. Okay, it's just amazing what you can do with it. And lastly, here is 3D printing, okay, or uh, of metals. So this is a titanium super alloy. Uh, TI6AL4V, which is very common in biomedical, right? It is used for implantable devices. This is like aluminum. It has a very high strength to weight ratio. High strength but low weight. Okay, so very advantageous for uh, aviation, biomedical, marine, all the other sectors. A very strong metal. Uh, to make it with 3D printing, we do, you can use something called selective laser melting. 
So you have this powder of TIE-64, and then you have a laser which goes layer by layer to build this product by sintering and fusing the powder particles. But a problem with this, the way it is done, you get the wrong alloy composition. You get an alpha prime plus beta phases, which is not correct. You need alpha plus beta. That is one problem. Second problem, you have a columnar structure. You need equiaxed, like we talked about, okay? So that we can avoid anisotropy. And lastly, there might be a problem with surface finish. So what you do typically, you get the product from a 3D printer. You then heat treat it. So this becomes equiaxed, maybe. And then you finish machine to get the right surface finish, okay? But in spite of all this, you can never avoid the alpha, alpha prime phase. It is always there, okay? To get alpha plus beta, you cannot use this process. So the frugal case, a single, nearly single pass, involves using the same setup on a preheated substrate, but my titanium is mixed with the inoculant. And when you start 3D printing this, right, you get an EQAX structure, you get alpha plus beta faces, and probably you need just one finished machining cut to get the right surface. Again, nearly a single process, low cost, correct alloy composition, okay, and good quality. Okay, so three examples of frugal manufacturing, how you can do this. And all these can be used to build what I call frugal machine tool systems, right? So we have to build machine tool systems which are intelligent enough in saving material on their own using the principles of frugal engineering and also the tools of industry 4.0 like big data, artificial intelligence, all these things have to be used with them. So uh, you have to use low cost machine tools. These machine tools themselves can be designed with the factor of frugality approach, okay? So that they consume lesser materials, they are low in cost and give good quality. And use industry 4.0 to save on materials, okay? So you build these uh, machines maybe with intelligence so that they get the right conditions to save on the wastage of material, if there is any. And use industry 4.0 again to improve quality of the workpiece that is coming out. Uh, my PhD student has developed a new, you know, uh, a frugal cutter based on the tenets of frugal manufacturing. She's currently in Purdue University. She got a scholarship. She's finishing some experiments for a PhD on that. We have patented this cutter, and when ready, this can be used for many of the, you know, CNC machining, you know, CNC machining activities for saving material and also giving good quality uh, products. Uh, benefits of the factor of frugality approach, it's a single number and rigorous design. So it's a modern safety factor. You can think of it that way. It includes a safety factor. So nothing changes with your safety factor based design. You just use the factor of frugality around that. You can get more out of it. Uh, a reliability approach. Reliability is the other approach to design other than the safety factor or now uh, factor of frugality. In reliability, it is stochastic. It is statistical. So you need more data to work on it. Okay, so that makes it also expensive and there are more uncertainties in it. But a factor of frugality approach is only a single number. The uncertain uncertainties are nicely accounted for by a rigorous design process. <clears throat> high reliability needs higher safety factor. And if we need higher safety factor, what happens? If you have a higher safety factor, what happens? Pardon me? Higher material wastage, typically. Exactly, right? So, again, higher reliability entails higher safety factor, which is not good. We are aiming for high reliability with low safety factor. Okay? It seems contradictory, but that is what we should be going for. High reliability doesn't mean that you need a padded design to improve your safety factor to make it better. Uh, reliability should be used with a factor of frugality. Maybe the two can be combined, you know, futuristic efforts. Look into that. But there are, of course, caveats and warnings for the factor of frugality. It varies with the sector, your, what frugality is. Frugality in the nuclear sector is different from frugality in automotive or some other sectors, okay? And especially when the human life is at stake, one has to move very carefully, cautiously, okay? And uh, 
constraints on resources, and rigor is very much needed, okay? You have to always aim for the most accurate models, for the most accurate data, for the best that is available. Only then can you be very sure about your design. Otherwise, you're introducing uncertainties. And the whole thing here was to avoid uncertainties, you know, to minimize them as much as possible, even with a low safety factor. And lastly, right, the last topic, quality control. You always have to do stringent quality control for these products. And so what qualify as control limits in quality control of conventional products, you, you might, we might have to make it more stringent. Your limits will go down, okay? Your control limits will actually become very narrow now for a frugal product. It cannot vary quite a bit because our design has to be really very good because of the, although we have limited resources, so our design has to be very good. So quality control has to be very stringent to make sure that this is the case. Even things like drifting, right, where you drift away from what is required, one has to be careful with these parameters, okay? The minimal that one can tolerate, the better for a frugal design. Uh, I think uh, that's the last slide for today. And question and answers, this is IIT Madras campus, beautiful. A lot of deers and we have a nice ecosystem. We have a lot of nice, you know, white bucks, black bucks, endangered, uh, spotted deers. So our institute is built sort of in a jungle. It's very nice, okay? It's very nicely kept and it's a paradise for jogging and, you know, kind of cycling. Okay, it's a nice jungle. Especially when it rains, it becomes more beautiful. It's like, you know, walking through a hill station or, you know, uh, very good for doing research. Keeps you motivated. So please, uh, questions. I know that uh, if you want to know more about this, right, I think a good thing is to look at the site frugalengineering.in and all the papers are available there. And there are three papers in the Royal Society Open Science, Open Access, okay? Just kind of refer to that, not a problem. You don't have to take a picture. Just write to me or I think this is going to be recorded and put in the link. You can refer to it. And in this site, you can refer to three of the papers from uh, Royal Society Open Science. There is one on frugal manufacturing, one on uh, complex systems, and one on the design. Okay? Just read those, more than enough. And when, you, when I give the homework and you attempt your questions, you can refer to that material and what I talked about in the class. Based on that, you can answer, okay? And I will be looking at your, your understanding, how you answer my questions when I grade you for these exams, okay? Answers are important, but I will be, how have you understood frugality? I'll be just looking from that perspective. So questions, please. Shoot, you know, please tell me, no problem. You can also email me later, do not hesitate. Email me and ask me, I will email back to you. And we'll give you enough time for the homework, okay? We'll give you enough time so you can think and answer back. So it, this is a new concept and please don't get worried. It's a new concept and I will help you as much as possible to answer them and get to the right answers. Sorry, kept you for six hours. I think close to six hours. I think we were... I think it, it, it would be good to kind of distribute these classes over a period of days, okay? Instead of having it on, which is kind of bad on the students and me too, so. If you don't have any questions, it is fine. We can stop here today. Kindly email if you have not understood anything and I will go to any length to explain you, explain to you, not a problem. And uh, they are supposed to record this and release it on the internet. I don't know when. We'll have to wait for that. But read those three papers and what you've understood today. And, you know, I sit in the Economic Geography building, room one, uh, 316. Okay. My, yeah, room 316. So my, if you have any, want to visit there and, you know, kind of talk about the difficulties, it's fine. I'm here till September end. But on and off, I have other appointments too that I have to go for some talks and all that. But usually I'll be there during the weekdays.